Hello, welcome to the Thursday, August 8th, 2019 edition of the Sands and the Storms and the Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Denver, Colorado. Usually if a company employee does install malware on their system, they do so without really knowing what's happening. They're falling for some email that contains the malicious attachment or they are installing software that they think is benign or maybe even they think they install a new security tool. Well, AT&T had sort of a different experience here in insiders in intentionally installing not just malware, but also installing network equipment to allow criminals access to AT&T's network. The goal here was actually not customer data. The goal here was unlocked codes for mobile devices. Usually if you do have a contract with AT&T, you need to wait for that contract to be fulfilled before you can obtain an unlock code and then move your device to a different carrier. This particular gang did offer third party unlock services for customers who could not legitimately unlock their phone with AT&T. Now, initially, they just essentially forwarded these requests to insiders who then provided the unlock codes. This then evolved into the insiders actually giving these criminals uh, credentials uh, to connect to AT&T's network. But of course, uh, these unusual access patterns were eventually discovered. In the end, the insiders did install malware and some unspecified network device. Now it says here wireless access. I'm not really sure if this is a Wi-Fi access point or really more like a cell phone modem maybe that bridged the AT&T internal network to a cell phone connection. So these criminals who apparently were located in Pakistan were able to connect directly to AT&T's internal network and obtain the unlock codes that they needed. Significant money involved here of the order of about a million dollars in bribes, but also in revenue from these unlock codes. About a year ago, a researcher, I believe it was a checkpoint, did research various vulnerabilities in RDP that allow malicious RDP servers to attack RDP clients. Now, this particular exploit path is a little bit unusual and Microsoft initially ignored these vulnerabilities, stating that they're not going to fix it because it doesn't really meet their threshold of requiring a patch. One issue that this researcher, for example, revealed was that the clipboard is synchronized between the RDP server and the machine connecting to it. So a malicious RDP server could affect and read the clipboard on the client connecting to it. And with that, uh, it was demonstrated, it can even be used to write files on the RDP client site. But then again, it's not that easy to trick someone into connecting to a malicious RDP server, which in part was why this vulnerability was ignored. However, it turns out that, well, this gets more interesting once you bring Hyper-V into the mix. With Hyper-V, there is an option where an administrator can connect to Hyper-V virtual machines via, well, RDP. So now if an attacker is able to get a hold of one of the virtual machines and compromise it, an attacker could use the RDP connection coming from the administrator system now to further escalate privileges and essentially attack the host via this vulnerability. This now raised the vulnerability to a level where Microsoft did actually patch it and a patch was released in July. This week, Microsoft released a blog post with some of the details behind this disclosure and uh, how this particular vulnerability was then patched. Well, and not like you need any more reasons not to expose network equipment's web admin interfaces to the public 
internet. Cisco just fixed two more vulnerabilities in its small business 220 smart switches. One of these vulnerabilities allows the upload of arbitrary files to the particular switch. The second one does allow for a buffer overflow and the execution of arbitrary code with root privileges. Neither of these vulnerabilities requires authentication in order to exploit them. And of course, even if you don't expose uh, these web admin interfaces uh, to the public internet, you probably still should go ahead and patch these because this would make sort of a great lateral movement vector once someone is actually inside your network. And yet more support for passwordless authentication. Mozilla announced that the just released latest version of Firefox for Android is now also supporting WebAuth and doesn't support yet the older version U2F, uh, but the passwordless authentication has now been added. This now leaves Safari and Internet Explorer as the two browsers that don't yet support it. Safari is supposed to support it in its next version. Internet Explorer, of course, is supposed to be more or less replaced with Microsoft Edge, which does already support web authentication. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.